Today we are facing some of the greatest challenges of our lives, from our health to political unrest, the environment, financial uncertainty, and the nation's racial divide. Welcome to Bill Myers Inspires. My idea for this show was to invite guests and get the conversation started, to take a deep dive into the issues that impact our world with an eye to exploring solutions. And we encourage our listeners to look within themselves to take decisive action to make a positive difference. Welcome to Bill Myers Inspires. I'm your host, Bill Myers. And today we are going to be talking about the future and the ideas uh, for reforming police departments. And um, today's show is entitled Police Reform to Better Protect and Serve. And today our guest, who will be with us momentarily, is the mayor of Ithaca, New York, Mayor Svante Myrick. And so to set up Good morning. Hi, good morning. How are you? I I'm doing fine. Give me just a second here. I'm going to sort of set up the show today. Um, as the nation grapples with ways to reform their police departments, Mayor Svante Myrick has a bold new vision for the police department and its role in the city of Ithaca, New York. My guest today, Svante L. Myrick, was sworn into office in January 2012 and became, at 24, the city of Ithaca's youngest mayor and first mayor of color. Svante was first elected to the, to the Common Council at the age of 20 while still a junior at Cornell University. Myrick has provided both local and national leadership in critical areas such as public health, housing, poverty, and access to education. In 2017, he was awarded an Aspen Institute Rodell Fellowship in Public Leadership, a program that identifies and brings together the nation's most promising young political leaders to explore the underlying values and principles of democracy, the relationship between individuals and their community, and the responsibility of public leadership. His other honors include the John F. Kennedy New Frontier Award, which recognizes Americans under the age of 40 who are changing their communities and the country with their commitment to public service, and being named to the Forbes magazine 30 under 30 list in the area of law and policy. Myrick is currently serving a third term as mayor of the city of Ithaca, and of late has done a lot of work in collaboration with community stakeholders, to develop recommendations to reform the Ithaca Police Department in an effort to improve police and community relations. Please welcome my guest today, Mayor Myrick, Svante Myrick. Welcome to the show today. It's, it's early. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. Thank you so much. I, I really appreciate you having me on. Yes. So, okay, before we go any further, I, how, how, should, how would you like for me to address you, sir? Oh, I'll respond to just about anything. Uh, Savant, Savante is good. Savante. Yes. Okay. okay, so now that we're there, Savante, yes. uh, please tell me of, of the, 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 the origin of the name. And also, you, mm -hmm. are, you identify, and I look at you, and I say, well, there's got to be some story in, in the composite <laughs> of this individual, both in name and in skin tone. So if you would yes, it is, us uh, on your back. It is, a, it is a Swedish name, hmm. and I am in a Facebook group with a bunch of other uh, people with the name Svante, uh -huh. or as they pronounce it, Svante. Ah. And uh, I'm the only one without uh, uh, blonde hair and blue eyes. So uh, my mother, my mother liked the name. She just, she, she really liked it. It's unusual uh, to, to see in the States. It's unusual to see in a black person, of course, uh, but she, she really liked it. And I, you know, it served me well. It's got a V in there, which I like, strong. Uh, ends with a vowel. It's, uh, there's a there's a lot uh, there's a lot to recommend it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, I like it. It, it 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 you know it it just sort of flows. But I just thought <laughs> well, let's get that out of the way before we go any further. I appreciate it. Yeah. Yeah. So so I am excited to have you on, and I first must recognize how you came across my radar, and it was from a a and a native 
of Ithaca, New York, who recently moved back to Ithaca, New York, uh, named Mia Korf. And she was actually my guest uh, about three weeks ago. And I was doing my second program on anti-Asian hate crimes. Mm -hmm. So I want to make sure and give credit to Mia Korf for uh, bringing you to my attention. And I am grateful that you are here. And also a quick shout out to uh, your assistant, Annie. She is fabulous. Nice. Yeah, yeah. I, I am. I am. Uh, we are so proud of Mia Korf. And uh, didn't realize she moved back. All the best people do. All the best people come back. I tell you, if you, if you I wasn't lucky enough to grow up here. I can't tell you how many folks did and then went out to explore the world and have great success like me has had. And uh, when, when seeing the rest of the world, they go, huh, that place I grew up was actually pretty special. Yeah. And decided to come back. So, so it's a, uh, it's common. Uh, yeah. Common. Well, that's, that's awesome. So, uh, you know, I, I wanted to, I'm, I'm very excited about this conversation as it relates to policing, because I had mentioned in my letter to you that I am from a law enforcement family. My father uh, is uh, retired now, but he served on the Indi Indianapolis Police Department proudly for 54 years. Wow. And uh, my youngest sister is approaching her 30th year on wow. the Indianapolis Police Department. So um, it's, it's very interesting because my father was uh, very well known in the entire city of Indianapolis because of the program that he headed for many, many years, yeah. which was called the Officer Friendly Program. Yeah. And it was the program where his division would go and enter the school system, uh, the, the grade schools, and would talk to them about uh, uh, the, the police being your friend, um, the police are the people that you go to when you need assistance or you're scared or, or, or what have you. But it was, it was very much a bonding, uh, a positive bonding that happened with young people. And, and I'm talking about generations because as I, you know, I'm, I'm 55 now. So over the years, I've come across many people who go, your dad was officer friendly, you know, and, and they know him. I mean, the entire public school system went through yeah. these, these programs. And so for generations, but my dad for the last 20 years uh, before his retirement uh, became uh, very concerned about the direction of the department. Um, he became very, very uh, disgruntled, quite frankly, with the training and the direction of the department. And I, I strongly suspect that it was that period that uh, maybe war on crime or sort of the militarization sure. of the police department and, um, and how that broke those bonds that were um, so carefully put in place uh, by building community that he had been an instrumental part of. So I just wanted to start with that uh, to give you a little background about my awareness of that um, and uh, and how powerful that was. I used to be so incredibly embarrassed because I wouldn't tell people that was my dad, you know, because it was just embarrassing. Because you, so you were in school, you would, you would go to the officer friendly sessions. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it would be the whole school, whole con, you know, the, the whole convocation of the entire school. And so I was embarrassed, you know, but, but truly, um, uh, he was a rock star. Yeah. I, I really, I really believe that I mean, he was a rock star in the eyes of those children and those grown adults today who think so fondly of that program and and uh, and can contrast that type of relationship and view of police very strongly uh, uh, different than what we see today. So again, the work that you are uh, engaging in, which I'm excited to hear about, is very very important work, and I hope that you're onto a model that. Uh, that the nation can adopt. I really hope that you're on to it. So, appreciate that. Yeah, yeah. I, I hope so too. I, we believe we are. We believe. Yeah. We are. Yeah. So that exact that kind of bond. I mean, first serving 54 years is unheard of. That's really yeah. amazing. That's that is an incredible amount of time to work. Well, period to work in any one place, and right. especially to work as a police officer. It's an extraordinarily long career. And I think you put your finger exactly on it. I mean, 
One, we should acknowledge that there are many people in this country that have never felt safe and comfortable around the police. I mean, going back 300 years, this, is, this has been a fraught relationship, especially uh, the black community, especially the most vulnerable communities. But there was definitely a shift. Things have been deteriorating over the last 30 years, especially. And it's exactly what you said. It's a, a more aggressive um, war on crime. Uh, war on drugs, and uh, the corresponding militarization of police departments, you know, and both in their, in their equipment, in their tactics, but also their culture, you know, and some of that was qu uh, quite literally the result of, of hiring. We would hire and just say, you know, you'd get an applicant that served overseas, and you'd go, well, they know how to wear a uniform, and they know how to use a gun, so they're 90% of the way there, let's hire them. <clears throat> put them on the street without stopping to ask ourselves, is, are those the two most important things about being police officers? Is it the uniform and the gun? Uh, is that what adds to a feeling of public safety? And is that who, um, you know, don't we want empathy? Don't we want community engagement and understanding the kind of things that, you know, officer friendly program, don't we want to build up ties so that people know that they can come to us? And the result has been this entrenchment, retrenchment, really, um, where I don't know if it's true in Indianapolis, but I know it's true in many places across the country where people just do not talk to police. They, if something bad happens, they do not call the police because they don't trust that when they show up, they will make the situation better. And they don't cooperate with investigations. We end up doing investigations by press release where the shooting will happen. And we send a press release that says, if you have any information, call this hotline. You know, that is not the kind of police work we used to have in this country. And it's not the kind of public safety system we need to have. So I don't know if this is a good time to just say what we've proposed in Ithaca. Sure, sure. I mean, it's a good time to sort of outline that and we can dig into it because I know we'll be coming up on a break here in a second. But yes, please. Yeah. So what we're proposing is that, you know, we found that not only are certain populations very wary of the police, afraid to talk to them, afraid to work with them, afraid to call them, because they're afraid of police violence, both what we've seen in on body camera footage, but also what certain communities experienced for generations. But also the, the police themselves know that they were being asked to do too much and not just a too big a volume of work, too varied, uh, uh, we call the police to do everything, right? If there's a human behavioral problem, we call the police, even if it's not a law enforcement problem. What we found is that the vast, vast majority of the things our officers are spending their time on are actually not criminal in nature and won't ever lead to an arrest. 35% of the things we dispatch our police to, we know because we know the statistics from the last six years have led to arrest 0% of the time. Right? It's 35% of calls before we even dispatch. We know that's not likely to lead to an arrest. When we put that together, we thought it's time to create a new department, a department that has armed workers in it, you know, what you call traditional police officers, but mm -hmm. also a unit of unarmed workers that can respond uh, and de-escalate and help build community solutions. So we're calling this new department a Department of Public Safety and Community Solutions. It'll be led by a civilian. Uh, uh, it could be somebody with law enforcement background, could just be somebody with a, a strong management background. Uh, and we think this will lead to an improvement in the quality of life of officers. It'll also allow them to focus on the calls for service that actually have the potential to be criminal in nature, allow them to dig deeper, rooting out the, the violent crime and guns, weapons, while giving us another tool in our toolkit to engage the community in a way that lowers tempers, the temperatures, which is showing up in an unarmed fashion. Mm. Yeah, that's that's that that's that's very interesting. So yeah, you, you, yeah, the police were, you know, uh, I mean, there's a dog on the loose. I mean, you right. know, yeah, you mean my 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 neighbors? Uh, I don't like the fence. Um, <laughs> uh, the, I mean, even taking reports. Like we don't even know how many reports are going, my bike was stolen last week, right? If you say my bike was stolen last week, uh, I'd like somebody to come and take a report. There's no reason for an armed officer to show up to that, right? And True. in fact, the very presence of weapons, particularly people with past traumas or people who are uncomfortable around police officers might say, well, my bike's stolen last week. I'm not gonna, I'm just not gonna call at all. We want them to call. We want somebody to show up and take the report and talk to them about 
uh, uh, so, so that if it could be found or you could make an insurance claim. But all of that also takes time away from the things that the officers need to be focused on, which is preventing gun violence. So uh, really looking for this new model. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. I mean, uh, I, I'm excited about that, uh, that overview and that analysis because it's, it's so very true. We are going to take a break right now, and we will be back in just a moment and continue our conversation on police reform with Mayor Svante Myrick of Ithaca, New York, in just a moment. Today, we are facing some of the greatest challenges of our lives, from our health to political unrest, the environment, financial uncertainty, and the nation's racial divide. Tune in every Friday at 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time for Bill Myers Inspires as he and his guests take a deep dive into the issues that impact our world with an eye to exploring solutions. Emmy Award-winning actor Bill Myers is an accomplished actor, jazz musician, filmmaker, writer, educator, and speaker. As a biracial man who's both black and white, Bill leverages his background, talent, and voice through creativity, compassion, and connection as activism for social justice to focus on uniting the divide and compelling change. Bill Myers Inspires encourages listeners to look within themselves and take decisive action to make a positive difference. For more information, visit his website, BillMyersInspires.com, and sign in for the latest news and updates. Are you a subject matter expert? Are you here to share your expertise with an audience waiting to hear from you in only the way you can deliver? Are you ready to have your voice amplified across the airwaves? Inspire Choices Network has a global radio platform streaming to millions of people across the world. Professionally produced and supported by an accomplished team every step of the way, you can broadcast from anywhere in the world knowing your voice matters and we ensure it is delivered with ease and efficiency. Eager to hear your message, the world awaits. Contact us today to become an Inspired Choices Network radio host. Email become a host at inspiredchoicesnetwork.com. You're listening to Bill Myers Inspires here on the Inspired Choices Network. We're here every Friday. 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Thank you for joining us. And now, let's get back to the conversation. We're back, and you're listening to Bill Myers Inspires with my guest today, Mayor Svante Myrick of Ithaca, New York, and we're talking about police reform. And so you were saying beforehand, you, you gave an example of um, the idea of taking a police report or the bike being stolen. And uh, that triggered a nerve within me. So I, I do, I, I very much want to hear your perspective, but I'm going to share a story with you and uh, about escalation and, and, and something as simple as a police report. When I was uh, living in New York, um, I was, you know, performing on one of the one of the soap operas in New York, and I, we the cast went out at about six o'clock p.m. to uh, you know bar to just sort of unwind, have a have a cocktail. On the way in the bar, I have a big bag and it had everything in it, ID, everything in it. Somebody knocked me down violently and took the bag, and um, so everybody goes in and settles. I go directly to the bartender and I said, "Hey, could you call the police?" I mean, this thing had my, you know, my house keys, my ID, my wallet, I mean, everything in it. And um, so um, as I was standing there, it's, it's this Friday evening, uh, rush, you know, a uh, uh, sort of happy hour time. So the place is bustling. I'm standing there and the bartender is being very gentle and kind about this horrible thing that just happened to me. Police officer walks in. And he's looking around and he says, somebody called police. I'm standing there and said, you know, the bartender gestured to me. And I told him, I said, um, I just was robbed, literally walking inside the restaurant. It was a bag, my belongings. And I, I just need to uh, have a police report. 
for insurance purposes and everything else. And he looked at me and he said, you know, what the F do you want me to do about it? Hmm. At which point the whole tone shifted in a second. And the bartender turned around and I mean, it was kind of like, whoa. And I said, well, I want you to write an effing police report <laughs> for me. Yeah. At this point, he reaches and unsnaps his gun. Wow. wow. At the same time, I then grab the bar stool that I'm sitting on mm. and raise it because the only instinct mm. I had was you're perhaps going to have to defend yourself because there is something that is about to perhaps escalate. Again, keeping in mind that I am a cop kid and I know protocol and how you don't do that. But I also understand that there's this strange gray space that happens um, when you are dealing with law enforcement or anything else that steps into beyond. It's a twilight zone space. Now it becomes almost kill or be killed because it is no longer let's play by rules or have some civility about it. All of a sudden we have just launched ourselves into the twilight zone. And I don't know how this is going to go because this is against the rules. This is against, you know, I know he is out of order. (laughs) You know what I mean? And so consequently I can stand there and make myself a victim to this, or I can say not here, not today. I'm not the one. Um, this so upset me and he eventually did write the report, but there's several other moments of escalation that happened, but nonetheless, he wrote the report and threw it on the bar and walked out. I was so traumatized by that experience. And I say traumatized that I was no good for about two or three days and had to fly back home to Indianapolis to be in the presence of my father. Mm because the thoughts that were going through my head Hmm. were ones that I didn't think this gentleman should have another day on this planet or talk to another individual. Mm -hmm. And I shared my heart with my dad that I had some really evil thoughts and they were only one. It was send this guy to the next realm. And my father listened to me. And then he shared with me experiences that he had, Mm -hmm. um, traveling throughout the South or going to conferences for the police department in his police car being pulled over in Alabama on some dark road by an Alabama trooper and him having the same feeling Mm -hmm. that no longer are we acknowledging each other as fellow officers. I am a black man. You are a white man. And um, this could turn. So uh, it, it really took me, it traumatized me. And I was able to get back to New York. But that conversation with my dad uh, was very important. But that moment off of a simple police report. So when you said that, and that's the first time I've ever said that story publicly, I just want to say, because I'm almost ashamed that I had the feelings that I did. Yeah, but uh, it's not, can I, tell, can I tell you that, and I appreciate so much sharing that because this is especially in the in the black community stories like this Mm -hmm. have existed for generations and they were if believed at all they were rarely taken seriously it was like well he said something rude to you get over it and it's it's only once we have cameras everywhere that people are starting to see and take seriously how badly these interactions can go but I can tell you that what led us to make such a transformative change here in Ithaca to decide to make this change was we did these deep community listening sessions over the last 10 months. And it was story, those sto- incident after incident, almost every black person we spoke to had at least one story where the n- number one takeaway, the main takeaway was that they felt dehumanized, dehumanized by mm-hmm. law enforcement. And that that is just unacceptable. That's not what the profession should be. That's not what the mission should be. It should be unacceptable. And the person, you know, he should have never been on the job in the first place, that officer. We've got to do a better job of screening out. You know, what we started doing six years ago in Ithaca is 
um, doing psychological testing for applicants. We do psychological screening and polygraph tests to figure out not just their implicit bias, right? If they've got a racial bias, um, but especially if they've got an authoritarian bias, which is what it sounds like was the deal with this officer. Mm -hmm. If he's got a, I'm the, the boss around here and you're not gonna tell me what to do and I'm here, what do you want from me? That attitude lead, is what leads to violence and is what damages trust where there should be. As you said, your sister's in law enforcement, your father, 54 year veteran of the force. If anybody should feel safe and comfortable around police officers, it should be you. But all it takes is one officer to, to fracture that trust. And we've just seen too many fractures. That's why we've, we've got to change. Yeah, yeah. It, it's, so, it's so interesting because I, I must say that every time I have been pulled over uh, as, as an adult or stopped or questioned by the police, um, I have never felt comfortable with that exchange. I was always, I mean, you know, on pins and needles, not knowing first of all, you stopped me. I wasn't speeding. <laughs> I mean, so I, you know what I mean? So I'm already going, okay, what is this? Um, you know, um, mistaken identity, wh whatever. I mean, whatever you could write it off to be, but it's a scary experience because I just don't know how this is going to go. And also it probably was scary all the time anyway, because of my father being a police officer, I never felt like that gave me a pass. In fact, I never wanted to bring disgrace you know, upon him, uh, or, or anything like that. Um, you know, I know some other folks who are cop kids who, you know, I mean, drink and drive at me, you know what I mean? <laughs> they get pulled over every week and it was like, Hey, my dad is. And so, you know, well, you know, I'll pass. Yeah. I never did that. Um, I bet I thought if you caught were me, they, were they white kids just for reference? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And like, for us, there was all this added pressure of, you know, we have to represent ourselves well. I mean, there's also an added fear. I'm sure you got the talk, which was, you know, people are going to be jumpier around you. Well, the police officers are going to be jumpier around you. Don't take chances. Be deferential. Speak quietly. No sudden movements. Um, yeah. And I didn't realize until I was older that not all kids, because I'm, you know, I'm mixed as well. I didn't realize that not all kids got that talk. It was yeah. when I was a teenager and I watched the way some of my friends, which are my white friends, talk to police officers, talk about police officers. I was like, I was shocked. Mm -hmm. they yeah, they didn't get the same talk we did. Yeah, yeah, interesting. It's so very interesting. Mm -hmm. So, so okay, so I, so I wanna hear more about your plan. I didn't wanna commandeer this conversation. I didn't realize it was gonna be, you know, <laughs> exercising my own demons or something, but. Well, uh, it, it's an emotional, now I, I'm really happy you share that story because it's, I mean, this is what we have to fix. And, you know, I forget who says it, but not, not um, everything that can be faced can be fixed, but uh, nothing can be fixed unless it's faced. Absolutely. And also we're very, very honest about what's wrong with this profession, what's wrong with this way of delivering public safety. We're not going to be able to fix it because you can focus on, and, and look, the, the vast majority of officers do a great job and they're in this for the right reasons. And um, most interactions go well. And it's important to say that, but it's also important to not let that be the end of the conversation. You know, I mean, nobody else can say, well, I do my job good most of the time. So why, why are we talking about improvement? We cannot allow, I mean, the, the consequences for, for some of these mistakes are fatal. Yes. Uh, the consequences for some of these bad actions are fatal. And the consequences of all of these bad interactions is terroristic. That's what it does. I mean, it, you know, uh, the act of a terrorist is somebody who thinks that if they scare you, they can change you. And they can change your behavior, change your thoughts, change your beliefs. And Bill, that's exactly what happened to you. You know, you, it was a dehumanizing exchange where he felt like he had power and control and, and could intimidate you with his, with his service weapon, right? Something that was meant to protect and serve. And it changed you. That's why I had to go talk to your dad. And that's a, a horrifying outcome. It, sh it should never be the case. So we think, you know, we're, we just made the decision to build this department. Uh, the Common Council adopted the plan uh, three weeks ago. They Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. And so now 
it's like, yes, congratulations, you've bought yourself a ton more work. Uh, over the next couple of years, we've got to design and then implement the department, find a director of public safety and community solutions and start to build out the unarmed workforce. And really dig deep into all of our, our the, the, you know, to change a culture is a really difficult thing. This seems like a touchy feely subject, but it's, but it's not when we talk about culture. Right. There are certain defining characteristics of a culture when you think of um, like what's the difference between us and France? It's the way we dress, it's the way we speak. It's what we find funny, right? They find Jerry Lewis uh, hilarious. I think <laughs> like sort of funny. Um, right. <laughs> uh, what's acceptable? Who's acceptable to make fun of? Who's not? The police have their own culture of what's funny and what's not. Who can you make fun of and who can't you? How do you talk? How do you carry yourself? And you know, right now there's a lot of folks who are just saying, well, if we just do some more trainings, let's do a couple of trainings, make sure that they don't shoot the wrong person anymore. That's not going to be enough because a training is not enough to change a culture. And I know that because I took French classes every year through middle school and high school, an hour a day, every day. And I could not order an omelet uh, in, in Paris right now. So it's to, to change a culture, you know, culture is so it's everywhere and it surrounds us. It's culture is to people what water is to fish. And if you ask the fish, how's the water today? They wouldn't even understand the question. Right. If you ask them how to improve the water, they wouldn't understand that either. So when you've got a culture that's for too long has allowed abuse, uh, you, you really have to start fresh and start, start new. That's why we felt it was important to create this new department and not just tinker around the edges of the old one. Yeah, because yeah, that that's that's trying to put band aids on a chest wound, uh, yeah. Yeah. you know, or dealing with a symptom. You know, you, I got the runny nose, but you haven't addressed the cold. Um, <laughs> so no, I, I'm I'm with you. I, I'm 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 so with you, and I'm excited about that. So, so what are the 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 steps that you see uh, in being able to frame that out? I mean, you said you're looking for a director, but I mean, I'm just I'm just very curious what your sort of step process and possible timeline is for at least projecting it at this point because yeah yeah and they would they would only be projections but um i i think it's fair to to guess that by this time next year we'd like to have the new chief or the new director uh, uh of the department on board and we'd like to at least have a pilot up and running of of uh, a couple of unarmed workers per beat per shift out there on the street uh, we'd like to to start to see how, how uh, they make themselves useful, how it changes uh, all of the operations inside the department. Um, and I think, we're, I think we're two, maybe three years away from a full build out. But again, those really are just estimates, you know, government uh, and the best laid plans. And, and, sure. and we really wanna do this in an iterative way. We wanna to start to make the changes, then stop, look around, see, are, are they working as we intended? And, and collect data along the way. Um, so, but yeah, we think that's the next step. We've got a task force now that's set up to start the designs, the, the crafting the position description for the director of public safety, crafting the position descriptions for the new unarmed community solution workers and working with dispatch to figure out who are we gonna send to what calls. We're also uh, committed to working with our partners in Tompkins County, especially around mental health, mental health calls. These are calls that have gone to the police, not for any good reason, just for the only reason that they, the officers are, it's a 24 seven operation where not everything else is. And so uh, if something's going wrong at 11 o'clock at night, you don't think to call the Department of Social Services, you don't think to call the, the mental health department. Um, instead, you just call the police and you hope that they can help somebody who's in distress or somebody who's experiencing a schizophrenic break but I'll tell you what happens so often is that the people who are in distress, when a police officer shows up at their house or the workplace or mm -hmm. confronts them on the street, it does not lower their distress, right? It doesn't calm them uh, and make them eager to comply. It, it puts their life in danger and it puts in danger the life of the police officers themselves. So coming up with little alternative responses, like we've seen work for decades in Eugene, Oregon, uh, is a... Um, 
a, a big part of our plan that we hope to implement right away. Yeah, so so I'm very curious in in the the makeup of these unarmed uh, officers that that will be sent out is are there specific criteria or or um, skills that you are looking at that that need to be um, there? You, you know what I mean? I, I'm just very curious, and I know you're framing out job descriptions and things as. Yeah, yeah. So it's still it's still very early, but exact. The first thing is we're looking for um, a grounding in the community. You know, sounds like the kind of thing that your your father and your sister. Uh, uh, this is true. It's true of our police department, but I don't want to pick on our police department because it's true of most police departments. The vast majority of our officers, ninety percent of our officers, don't live inside the city, and. Uh, that has a profound effect on how they view their job, how they view this community, how the community views them. So building stronger community connections and our diversity of, of the department too. You know, there's, there's no reason that the department shouldn't be 50% uh, women and 50% men because that's the, the gender breakdown of our community. And it should reflect the, the racial diversity of our community too. So those are the things we're looking for right away. But the, the personal characteristics beyond just the department demographics are great skilled communicators, people who are assertive and extroverted, but still kind, uh, generous, uh, and focus on de-escalation, right? Uh, lowering temperatures. You know, we want folks who are going to be willing to walk the streets, uh, get out of their cars, walk around, talk to people make connections, make friendships, uh, and become trusted partners. So then when something goes wrong, a bike gets stolen, or you happen to know about somebody has an illegal firearm, or you're worried about a neighbor, you know that you can call and the person who shows up, you'll know, and you, you'll, you'll trust that they'll act appropriately. Yeah, so I, I'm, that, that, that's fantastic. So I'm curious about, um, Community allies, i.e., uh, churches, uh, things like that, that, and how they may be able to be infused in in a larger community view um, mm -hmm. as allies, or and not just the church, but I, but that just popped into my head immediately. Was like, whoa, what about other folks that can help, you know, shed some light in those dark places? Um, I'm just thoughts on that. Any thoughts there? Yeah, the, I, the faith community was extremely important in the development of this plan and will be really important in the implementation of it. And to the secular uh, community of, of, of um, community organizations, things like for us, it's the Greater Ithaca Activity Center and the Southside Community Center, places where people find, because look, that's actually how you make our our um, city safer, right? When you study safe places and you study the people who are least likely, least prone to commit violence uh, and to commit property crime, it's people with strong social connectivity, people who are active and engaged in their church, in after school activities, at work, in, in third places, you know, places that aren't work or aren't home, but they, they, have, a, they have a book club they're active in every week or they go to Rotary every Tuesday. Um, when you have those strong social bonds and ties, not only are you more likely to get all of your human needs met, talking about your housing and food, those securities, as well as basic uh, emotional affirmations, you're also just less likely to um, act out in ways that are antisocial. So we really need to, instead of, you know, um, focusing on the pathologies of crime and, and studying neighborhoods and, and people that end up committing crime, we should be doing the reverse. Let's study successful communities and replicate them. And the, 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 uh, especially the churches, the traditionally African-American churches here have been huge and influential part of our planning here from Calvary Baptist um, uh, on down. Mm -hmm. So what exactly is the, the, the um, racial composite of Ithaca, New York? Mm -hmm. 
It's, it's, uh, you know, it's for a small city in upstate New York. It's quite diverse. Uh, we've, we're about 65, I think it's 60, 65% white, uh, the remainder people of color. Uh, large portion of, of AAPI folks, a lot of Asian, Asian American folks, in part because of the universities here at the college, TC3 and Cornell University. And uh, um, about the national average for Black folks and, and Latino folks. So mm. it's, you know, it's, it's a diverse community. We're very proud of the successive waves of immigration, uh, particularly refugees uh, that have made our community more diverse with each passing generation from Vietnamese to Burmese to um, uh, Iraqi and Afghanistan refugees. Um, and that it does, it creates challenges. It creates things that your community has to work through. And every single time it's created more opportunities than barriers. You know, we find that the, our differences to, to paraphrase Bill Clinton, our differences are interesting, but ultimately unimportant. Yeah, so very true. Because at the end of the day, I mean, it's still humanity. And we, we, we focus on the us and them. And again, my message is us is them. <laughs> so, you know, and so how do we focus on be, being better human beings to one another? And then, I, I, again, trying to find the common ground. So we can sit up and look at the differences, uh, you know, similar to what you just said a moment ago, all day long. And it's like, that doesn't, that doesn't bring us together. <laughs> it's still not doing it, you know. So, yeah, man, I, I think it's very exciting. And it sounds to me like the, the, the uh, uh, demographic sort of breakdown of your community is, is uh, uh, replicated or, or, or similar to most of the nation's communities. So that's a wonderful uh, um, balance uh, that seems to be probably maybe 70% of the country. I mean, just based on my previous research as far as communities and, and breakdowns. And so I think that that is a, a, um, a wonderful testing ground uh, to find out and to um, implement these different changes that you are talking about. And uh, I think it's very, very exciting. Uh, and I agree with you that I do not believe that uh, the idea of, you know, a band-aid fixes mm. they they've never lasted right. they've never lasted because whatever we did that would seem like a good idea the band-aids come off and we're back to where we were and so that did not work so i i am a believer that at some point perhaps the model that we keep following is broken and if it is broken it it's not an issue of repairing it it's about cultivating a new model, you know. That's uh, exactly right. I mean, these are, when these police departments were designed, we were all using push mowers. And I don't mean, I don't mean they weren't rider mowers like a John Deere. I don't mean they were gas powered, but you push them around. I'm talking about the, that little wheel that would turn and cut the grass. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, this is, they are antiques. And you can keep trying to add grease to that, but it'll never work as well as a lawnmower designed and built in the 21st century. It is time we design and build public safety systems in the 21st century for the 21st century. Instead of being stunned that this thing that was created in 1840 isn't working out. You know, the private sector wouldn't, wouldn't do it this way. They would say, oh no, I think we'll sell more typewriters next year. We just need to, let's just tweak, let's, let's work on the spacing of the keys again. Maybe that was the problem. It, it, will take a fundamental re restart, I believe. Yeah, I agree with you. I agree with you 100%. Um, and I think it's very exciting. It's, it's very exciting to be in the creative process um, and to, to really, um, well, there's so many other factors, uh, you know, um, where we are socially, where we are, uh, the, the demographic makeup of, of the nation. Is it relative? Is it serving the same community? Were the same communities existent? The same balance of those communities was the same, you know, 100 years ago, 150 years ago. Um, you, you know, uh, the circumstances, the societal environment circumstances have changed 
awareness has changed, but again, trying to still do the push mower, <laughs> it's, it's, it, it seems futile, futile yeah. to me. So I'm with you hundred percent on, yeah. on bringing and in. I, and I think when you have a change this big, it, it's not surprising that the results, if you're trying to transform one thing into another, like if you try and make your refrigerator act like an air conditioner, you, you can maybe, you could maybe do that. Right. If you make some tweaks, uh, you could maybe do it, but it will be hugely inefficient. It won't cool your place down. It'll run up your electric bill and you won't get the results you're looking for. And that kind of that kind of reform we've been offered before and we've seen it. It just it just hasn't worked to keep us safe. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's that that's fantastic. I'm I'm so excited for you guys, and uh, I'm excited that Mia told me to reach out to you. So we're we're coming up on another break, and I think we're going to take that right now. Um, you're listening to Bill Myers Inspires uh, right here on the Inspired Choices Network, and today we are talking about police reform with the mayor of Ithaca, New York, Mayor Svante Myrek, and we'll be back in just a moment. Today, we are facing some of the greatest challenges of our lives, from our health to political unrest, the environment, financial uncertainty, and the nation's racial divide. Tune in every Friday at 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time for Bill Myers Inspires as he and his guests take a deep dive into the issues that impact our world with an eye to exploring solutions. Emmy Award-winning actor Bill Myers is an accomplished actor, jazz musician, filmmaker, writer, educator, and speaker. As a biracial man who's both black and white, Bill leverages his background, talent, and voice through creativity, compassion, and connection as activism for social justice to focus on uniting the divide and compelling change. Bill Myers Inspires encourages listeners to look within themselves and take decisive action to make a positive difference. For more information, visit his website, BillMyersInspires.com, and sign in for the latest news and updates. You're listening to Bill Myers Inspires here on the Inspired Choices Network. We're here every Friday at 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Thank you for joining us. And now, let's get back to the conversation. We're back and you're listening to Bill Myers Inspires. And today we're talking about police reform with the mayor of Ithaca, New York, Mayor Svante Myrick. And um, before we go any further, I want to share some good news with all of our listeners. Inspired Choices Network has a new mobile app, uh, which can be downloaded in the Apple or the Android app store. And you are able to listen and join the chat room on this app and, and click on and check out all of our shows. So check it out. It's free. Just search for Inspired Choices Network. Uh, the, the good mayor is going to download that app here in just a moment. And, <laughs> and we have a contest. So if you download this app and take a selfie or, or a photograph with you and you show us that you have that app, you can enter a contest. And we have really, really wonderful prizes and things like that that we're giving away. And so you just send that photo to the Inspired Choices Network and get your goodies. So we're back. Uh, I, it is a pleasure today to uh, have with us Mayor Svante Myrick of Ithaca, New York, and um, we are discussing police reform and the um, uh, the ideas. I just have to say, I think that it is wonderful uh, that you had you obviously put together a proposal, and then you have to go through the city council and all of the you know the the uh, obstacles there. Um, can we talk about some of that? Because you've obviously overcome them, but those are always very interesting and dramatic hero stories. When we're able to say, I survived, you know? Yeah, <laughs> yeah and this was really tough because our, our police, in this case, 
uh, you, any changes you make to the policing system draw a lot of blowback because it's just fear. People people don't want to be the victims of crime. They they want to feel safe and and even if there's deep dis- dissatisfaction with the way things are, there's an old joke in government that the only thing people hate more than the status quo is change of any kind. Uh, and that is definitely true when you're dealing with policing and particularly with the police unions that were, and I'm, I'm using the plural here because um, the police, the New York City Police Union, uh, the Long Island Police Union, others got involved in our local Ithaca discussion. And, and that's, you know, again, it's reasonable for people who are in law enforcement, you'll know from your family members, Mm-hmm. This is more than just a job. It is part of their identity, and changes to their identity are understandably feel very threatening. Um, so we had a lot of that to work through. I mean, it required a lot of, you know, there were some pretty sharp words and hard elbows and some nasty social media posts because that's the world we live in, and email letter writing campaigns, and the the local car dealership here got involved advocating against reforms to our public safety system. Uh, meanwhile, you know, the broad swaths of the community were coming out saying, this is exactly the kind of change we need. Mm-hmm. You know, and the, the thing about having a common council that's engaged and that is as discerning as, as our council here is in Ithaca is that it's just really, it's really useful. I mean, we don't have a dictatorship for a reason. Um, there are times when I wish we did have a dictatorship and I, you know, everybody just do what I say and, and, uh, everything will go smoothly. But when there's real differences of opinion, you know, I, I developed this, um, recommendation along with 50 members of this working collaborative that we assembled, but, you know, 10 people chosen elected from their neighborhoods to serve on the city council are the ones who kick the tires. They, they pull it apart. And we had, I don't even know how many meetings we had in about a two month span. And it, it can be, I don't know if you've ever had this experience, especially in public policy, when you're drafting policy, that um, new, new policies are kind of like newborn babies, which is if it's yours, it's beautiful. <laughs> if else's, it looks kind of funny. Yeah, and and uh, uh, sometimes they've got it. You know, they got to age a couple weeks and go. Oh, okay, that's a beautiful baby. <laughs> and and, <Human>. and <laughs> like all, you know, just like babies, you don't want anybody messing with it. You don't want anybody poking around or uh, giving it a haircut or changing it this way and that. And you you really have. I've been at this. I, I started quite young. I was twenty years old when I was first elected to mm-hmm. the city council, and twenty four when I was elected mayor. So this is my 14th year in office. So I have quite a lot of experience just saying, look, this was, you know, these ideas I stand behind. The collaborative put them together. Um, I will back them because I helped assemble the collaborative. And, and I think they're good ideas. But you own this now, Common Council. And any changes that you want to make to it, um, you can. And, they, and there were changes and, you know, uh, amendments. And I tried to help guide where I could. But it really is just useful to know, you know, if you have an idea, and yeah. 10 members from the community who are selected by all their neighbors to represent them, come out and tell you you're way off base, then you're probably way off base. Yeah. And if yeah. they get together and the 10 of them say, let's, let's go for it, then yeah. you're on the right track. Yeah, that's awesome. Well, I, I'm, I, yeah, I know there are challenges along the way, but it's, I'm glad that you, you landed on the other side of that and you're able to move forward and, and create the kind of progress that the larger community really seeks. And the nation is looking at you, sir. So um, thank you so much for being with us today, Mayor. And um, thank you, Bill. I hope we can stay in touch. I, and I, re- I really appreciate hearing about your family and your, your story. And, uh, you know, and we got to stick together. Us, yes. the, the mixed kids. We we're, stick in it. we're in it together, man. We're in it to win it. Thank you so much for being here. Um, wow, it's been a great conversation on police reform. You're listening to Bill Myers Inspires right here on the Inspired Choices Network. See you next time. Thank you for spending your afternoon right here with us at Bill Myers Inspires. Remember, we're here every Friday at 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time 
on the Inspired Choices Network. Remember to take time this week to take a breath and look within yourself and figure out how you can make a positive difference in this world. Spread the word, and we'll see you here next Friday. Have a wonderful week.